And we have returned to the realm of dumping on each of the eight elitist individual wiffle ball franchises based out of the state of Michigan. Brighton's MLW wiffle ball has seen one of the biggest 180 turns in a matter of months after teams from the bottom last year have risen to the top and the former dynasties have taken a nosedive to the bottom of the standings. Returning players have dramatically improved while entire teams see themselves currently struggling on both sides of the ball. All kinds of chaos and trends are currently happening at this halfway point of the season. So where exactly do we start in this absolute mess? Oh. Daniel Schultz, no! There ain't no better place to start but the top. The Eastern Eagles had this potential all along, and it took one managerial move for manager Daniel Schultz to finally realize it. With Neil Smith and Clayton Price officially out of the picture, their move to the, to the reserves, it opened up the door for Dallas Allen, Landon Yurgaitis, and Blade Walker to emerge as a next wave and new era for the Eastern Eagles. Boy, have the Eagles flown to the top of the league. Dallas has literally allowed zero runs in his five starts, snatching the number one pitcher role from Daniel Schultz. To back up that tandem, you got Walker, Yurgaitis, and a resurging first-time all-star Zach Whalen, who have been hitting dinger after dinger and providing the run support needed for their pitchers, outscoring their opponents by a staggering 36-3 across nine games. This team has way too many pieces and too much power to lose it all. Early World Series favorites? Possible, but not too sure after their one loss somehow came to the team with the worst record in the league. How in the hell did the wizardly men manage to pull that one off? Although the Midwest Mallards may currently have second place in the National League, this team remains questionable in ways that nobody could have exactly imagined when you have a revitalized star at the plate in Tommy Coughlin and arguably the nation's best wiffle ball player in Jordan Robles. This two-headed monster of talent should be raking through every pitching tandem they face. The difference between them and the first-placed Eastern Eagles is quite clearly the depth behind them. Robles had zero support from Caden Irwin, Brendan Davenport, or Ben Wilson at the plate against the Eagles, not to mention the other two series against the Cobras and Diamondbacks, while the Eagles have five potent guys throughout their lineup. Tommy randomly went silent in that one series against the Eagles, and somehow the hitters started feasting on Jordan Robles. The second pitching remains an issue as Tommy isn't fully healthy and he's not back to form yet, Caden looked less than poor in his one appearance, and Davenport is still a question mark until he gets more time. Yes, they have two superstars, but there is a glaring, very obvious hole and lack of depth on this team, leaving them still vulnerable to mathematically get screwed over and fall to the bottom of the National League and the league overall for the third straight year. Not sure if these next two teams will do much about that, though. And the Mallards sweep the D-back. Slider shot gone! Where in the hell do I even start with the remaining teams in the National League? Somehow the team that had a very, no, sorry, extremely poor start to the season in the Great Lakes Gators remains in third place in the NL. Like last year, the boys are 3-6 and six at the break, and also like last year, Chris Cheatham has seemingly dragged them to the wins they got. 4 of 6 of the team's homers and 12 of the 20 RBIs belong to Chris. A 2.66 ERA, while second pitcher Brendan Jorgensen has been nothing short of pathetic. Sporting a 10.42 ERA in 6 and a third innings is amazing for a second pitcher, is it not? That's 2021 Midwest Mallards levels of bad. Zerlag only has one home run through nine games, and Reese Harris seems like the bust of this draft. Seven strikeouts and his seven at-bats, god damn that is brutal. Barely taking a win in the opening series that they were otherwise destroyed in, getting smoked by the Eagles had them looking like they were the worst team in the league, and then a Chris Cheetah masterclass against the reigning World Series champions single-handedly dragged them into third place. I had a feeling they'd be atrocious this season, but one player saves that. Gators fans, I present your god, Chris Cheatham. Is our final in game three. That is huge. For Listen, it's nothing that I have against Jorgensen, but he can't go ahead and make this comment about not getting swept when he's barely contributed to the team's success, but has contributed to the team's struggles tremendously. Like, what the f Big spot for the rookie. There's no words that can describe what has happened here. Oh, how the mighty have ever so fallen. Oh, AJ, calm down. They're just a game out of the postseason and they can get it done. That's not the point here. How can a team who just won the World Series in a season that their captain won literally half of the awards at the awards ceremony? They add two promising young players in the draft on top of that. How can they all of a sudden be 2-7 and seven by the All-Star break? The Wildcats loss makes sense. Getting swept by the Mallards is heavily debatable. And a loss to a one-man team in the Great Lakes Gators 
old. That is unacceptable. Jimmy Norb cannot do it all at the plate, that is. With his injury this year, his pitching has been lackluster compared to his performance last year. His right hand man last year, both on the mound and at the plate, Jonah Heath, is batting below 200. He's been poor at best on the mound. Trey Flood is still young, and you can't fully depend on a 14-year-old to light up the rest of the damn league. And Michael Shima and Casey Bennett are both batting under 100. Last year is looking like the entirety of MLW was significantly weakened, and now that they've all returned to their maximum potential, the Diamondback Championship season is looking like a complete fluke. They have minimal time to turn it around, but they also got brutal opponents that they have to go against. Up to this point, the Diamondbacks have been absolutely snake bitten. They will. Oh, in the center field. Reverting all the way back to the top in another league, the Pacific Predators are on some kind of fire right now. When Warda had drafted Mac Hawley in 2022, I, among many, thought that this was the start of another poor season with disappointing results for the local franchise with a now 13-year-old fan base. Instead, these boys broke out of the gate on absolute fire, taking care of business against the Gators and nearly sweeping, snatching two of three while in Toledo against the reigning AL champions, and then sweeping the magic wands. That propels them to second overall and currently sitting in seed one for the AL with a pleasing yet somehow surprising 7-2 record. What the hell's been the formula to their success this year? Serviceable second pitching from Stephen McGlade, an on-base machine in Mac Hawley, an entourage of homers from the big three altogether, Russell hitting out of his mind in Series 1, the overall run support finally returning for Ryan Cratch, and Cratch himself playing like the MVP frontrunner with a sub-1 ERA, 4 moonshots on him, and 9 RBIs, not to mention the home run derby championship, currently undefeated on the mound as well. Literally everything that can go to plan right now for the Pacific Predators is doing just that. This is a team that right now, from the AL, they're seriously the only individual team safe from me dumping on any of them at all. The bottom of the second, he's done it! Not to mention Rudy Ramirez is back. Clearly back at full strength. She got aluminum square. Let's go! Let's go. Drew Davis to right! That's a bomb! How exactly do I describe my feelings about the Coastal Cobras? I want to root for their success, but at the same time, it seems that nothing is right in the world if the villains of the league are at the bottom. At least to me, they seem like the most villainous team in the league. Anyways, getting back on track here, just above 500 for a team that honestly has been playing much better wiffle ball than the record tells. Brendan Baranowski has gone from a potential third pitcher all the way up to an all-star caliber ace. Sawyer Bean is an up-and-coming option that is progressively developing behind him as a legitimate second pitcher on a contending team. Although forced to by injury, Davis has taken a step back from pitching, kind of what's needed after he tanked a whole game in one inning against the Mallards where he did not record a single out, instead he walked seven straight batters. It does not matter how successful the Coastal Cobras are, that'll go down as one of the dumbest moments, if not the dumbest moments moment of the season entirely. Offensively, Dr. Michael Page's patients, Sean Flynn and Drew Davis have been consistent forces. Andy Durant has seemingly faded away into the background. One walk-off homer does not blind us from how many times Andy has struck out. A league leading 25 times in 41 plate appearances. The one thing seemingly stopping the Cobras right now is Drew Davis as a manager. If he limits the playing times of certain guys and makes the wrong moves at the wrong times like he's done before, that can cost the Cobras everything by the end of the season. You got the pitching that's dominant, a defensively sound team, offense is producing, speed and utility off the bench, and depth on the roster. If this amount of talent can't get it done this year, I think it's about time for the Legacy of Failure video to come out. Barron knocks it down! The one! He packs him! Game over! And the left center field and gone! What a weird season so far for the Western Wildcats. The results are just all over the place. Beating the World Series champions on opening day, then falling to the team that missed the playoffs last year in the AL, and then the ones that choke if you don't blend their pregame meals they lost to as well. Kyle Schultz has gone winless on the mound, while Nick Saylor somehow, yes I still do not believe this, somehow has gone undefeated well until he faced the bigger beast in Brendan Baranowski. Jackson Pearson hits the odd home run. Kyle and Nicky Boy go back to back here and there. Otherwise, Kyle is relatively quiet at the plate. Ty Smith is currently in contention with Reese Harris for biggest bust of this draft class, limiting the team's depth, yet they still thrive as a three-man group. 
They have a record under 500 for the first time since early 2021 and have the Magic and Gators, two weak teams left to go until the postseason begins. Expect the boys to be okay, but they have got to find some consistency. The season has been so back and forth for this team. You don't know what Kyle Schultz, Nick Saylor, or Jackson Pearson you're going to get on the field at any given day. Show up for all three games going forward because the crunch is finally beginning. Also, how did Kyle make the all-star team over Sean Flynn? Like, the power of being the commissioner has to loom somewhere over here. Like, this makes no sense. Right, well, you guys know I love memes, and there is no team that is more of a meme right now than the Metro freaking Magic. I mean, what is there to say about these guys? They're sitting at 2-7. and seven. Our captain can't show up to games, which I get it. He's got a life, but that really ruins both the gameplay and morale for this team. Our so-called best player and power hitter is hitting 194. Liam Jackson is somehow hitting under 100. And his services are practically useless, especially in the field. If there's anything to say about this team is that we have two positives. And I don't know if you can call them positives. They're positives for us, but for the rest of the league, it's probably like, whatever. Jordan Curry's entirety has been great. The undrafted free agent signing somehow is our best player this year. And Bottoms pitching, which is good, but even just that is just inconsistent, just like every other aspect of this team. So something has to change. We lose this crucial series against the Wildcats. We're out of playoff contention. We don't have our pick, thanks to Trevor Bonham, who, by the way, can't hit a ball. We just need to blow it up. If we lose to the Cats, we need to blow it up. No picks until 24. Maybe trade Bonham away for a pick. Maybe Chadwick. Something needs to change. The rest of the league is going to be improving through the draft, but we can't do that unless we make any, any moves. This team just... Something needs to be done. Preferably sooner than later. God damn magic. Strike three looking from Sawyer Bien. And he's high. We have the magic going through the Wildcats and Cobras in the playoffs. And the Diamondbacks repeating as the NL pennant winners. And I have no words other than somehow 2019 is once again upon us. The Predators and Eagles lead their respective divisions. The Wildcats, Mallards, and Cobras all sit in the middle while the then expansion teams have had their successes and they now all linger toward the bottom of the standings after three years. The true definition of how the tables have turned. Wiffle ball is a crazy sport, folks. The second half should be as good as it always has been. Kicking us off, the Gators take on Mallards at Shangri-La Resort for MLW's second annual Oklahoma series. Ready for chaos? Y'all better be. Thanks again to Dark for, uh, for his rant on the Metro Magic and Mr. Akinola for the thumbnails over the last two years for these Haters Guide videos. Find their Instagrams down in the description below. Thank y'all very much for watching this video, guys. I will see you all next time. Peace out. Ox. Done. So we going to drive? Hooked around. Fair ball.